Today, we are going to be running through all of the books that I am anticipating coming out in spring of this year. There are a lot, let me tell you. This spring is shaping up to look so good. So let's get into it. First, we have Jump Knots by Hao Jingfang, which is coming out on March 12th, so very soon. In this book, the world has been divided into two factions, the Pacific League of Nations and the Atlantic Division of Nations. Three rival scientists within the Pacific League of Nations have formed an uneasy alliance after they realize an alien species has been trying to make contact with Earth and humans. They want to beat the more jingoistic Atlantic Division to unlocking these mysterious messages and their senders. But the whole balance will be thrown off by the appearance of a third party whose impact on Earth has been going on possibly for thousands of years and might cause serious changes in everything. This one has a really interesting premise to me. I'm not always a huge fan of first contact stories, but I think that this one has a really good twist element with there being a third species involved that's already living on Earth or a third entity. And that the first contact doesn't seem to be initially antagonistic between our protagonists and the alien species. Although there does seem to be a secondary conflict with the Atlantic Division of Nations who are more militaristic. Also on March 12th, we have One Eye Opened in That Other Place by Christy Nogle. As you know, I loved being Eula. Absolutely fantastic. When I saw that Christy Nogle's collection of short stories was going to be coming out this year, I immediately was like, sign me up. The blurb says the collection focuses on liminal spaces and the borders between places and states of mind. So this is similar also in theming to Beulah. So I'm really excited to see how Nogle continues to play with these ideas and also to get back into her just super immersive atmospheric writing. The Emperor and the Endless Palace by Justine Huang. This is March 26th. This book is giving Cloud Atlas, which is one of my favorite books of all time. In fact, it is my first tattoo. The tagline is, what if I told you that the feeling we call love is actually the feeling of metaphysical recognition when your soul remembers someone from a previous life. So the blurb then lists six people who are the same two men born over and over again across timelines continually finding each other and falling in love. An early reviewer described this book as being absolutely beautiful. So I'm excited to see this exploration of love. I just hope that there's no actual time travel because I do not like time travel. <laughs> Moving on to April, we have Lake of Souls by Anne Leckie. This is April 2nd. This is a collection of Imperial Rock stories from Anne Leckie. I have read just a one singular book from her. I will get to the rest this year and already obsessed. So I'm excited to get my hands on even more from this world. I'm unsure if this is a mixture of new stories or previously published stories, or if it's just all previously published stories or all new stories, but I'm excited to find out nonetheless. Also on April 2nd, we have Someone You Can Build a Nest In by John Wiswell. First of all, fantastic name. Absolute points for the title. Um, and this book sounds buck wild. The main character is Shishi Shen, who is a shapeshifter who lives as an amorphous lump at the bottom of a ruined manor. She is extremely happy with the way her life is currently going, but then, unfortunately, some hunters show up one day intent on murdering her. So she has to build a body to deal with this annoyance. Quote, a metal chain for a backbone, borrowed bones for limbs, and a bear trap as an extra mouth. Cute! Unfortunately, she is still chased out of her home, falls off a cliff, and becomes grievously injured. She is found by a human woman, Homily, who nurses Shishi Shen back to health. Homily mistakenly believes that Shishi Shen is also a fellow human. The two women begin to fall in love and Shishi Shen decides that Homily could be a really good co-parent. Shishi Shi Shen's conception of co-parenting and love is for Shishi Shen to plant, uh, to lay her eggs inside Homily and when the young hatch, they will consume Homily from the inside out. 
the titular nest in the titular body, if you will. Shi Shi Shen realizes that Homily is not going to be a huge fan of this homicidal love, decide to reveal who she is to Homily in order for them to maybe have a life together. But before she can do that, Homily reveals that she's in the area to hunt a shape-shifting monster who has cursed her family. Shi Shi Shen is like, Huh, I didn't curse anyone's family. And so now we have all of these levels of mistaken identity, monster, hunter, enemies to lovers, but they don't realize that they are enemies yet, and only one half of them knows they are enemies. There are also other people still hunting Shi Shi Shen, the same hunters from before. And also on top of all of that, she has to deal with her in-laws. This just sounds like absolute wild time, absolutely fantastic. I don't even know what to fully expect from this book, except for just loving gruesomeness. Moving right along to the second Tuesday in April, we have The Familiar by Lee Bardugo. And I think this one is probably on a lot of people's anticipated books of the year. Not only because Lee Bardugo is much beloved, but this is an entirely new genre for her, historical fantasy, and is based on her own family history. The story is set in Madrid sometime in the past. I don't know exactly when, but Madrid is referred to as the new capital of Spain. Our main girl, Luzia, has some magical powers that she uses in her work as a scullion. But when her mistress finds out that Lu Luzia has these magical powers, the woman wants to use Luzia's powers in order to increase her own family's standing. Of course, the general public finds out about this and Luzia quickly gets brought into all sorts of levels of intrigue and politics, the Spanish Inquisition, all this sorts of crazy goings on. I'm expecting this to have all of Bardugo's normal flair for making you super emotionally invested in characters and just finally crafting that level of putting them through hell for the payoff at the end. I'm excited enough about this one that I actually pre-ordered it, so hopefully I'll be able to get to it relatively soon. Ghost Station by S.A. Barnes, also April 9th. If you recall, I read another book by Barnes, Dead Silent, last year, and it was a fun time. And I will admit, the premise for this book is somewhat similar in vibes. An exploration crew is trying to establish residency on an abandoned planet, and also trying to uncover the mystery of why everyone abandoned this planet. Maybe they shouldn't go to an abandoned planet. Mm. But then everything is thrown into disarray when their pilot is discovered dead, presumably murdered. It is giving the same story different font, but I'm not mad about it. Dead Silence was a good time, and I expect this one will be as well. Moving right along, we have The Practice, The Horizon, and The Chain by Sophia Samatar coming on April 16th. We're back in my high concept science fiction comfort zone with this one. Since the main character is referred to as the boy and the other as the woman, I'm assuming they do not in fact have names. So, the boy is one of The Chained, an ever-rotating stream of work gangs condemned to toil in the hold of a ship for all of eternity. But the woman, a professor, brings him out of the hold of their shared ship, I assume, to give him an education. The two become increasingly entangled as they learn from each other, and they embark on a journey to grasp the shape of the chains that are both the tools of subjugation and the key to breaking free. So this all sounds very contemplative and meditative about freedom and justice, literal and metaphorical chains, if you will. Bitter Water Opera by Nicolette Polek, also April 16th. An entry from an independent press, Bitter Water Opera is about Gia, who is struggling with life and depression. In the midst of all of this, she discovers a photo of Marta Beckett, a dancer who in the 60s bought, restored, and danced in an abandoned theater at Death Valley Junction. Gia discovers this history and writes Marta a letter, who then magically appears in her home. A series of other mysterious circumstances occur and drive Gia to Marta's desert theater, where she hopes she can find the answers she seeks. This novel promises to be a contemplation on our relationship with humans and with art and the very function of art within those relationships. It sounds lyrical, mournful, and cutting with the perfect dose of the magical and supernatural. A Letter to the Luminous Deep by Sylvia Cathrall coming on April 23rd. I'm so excited about this one. I also have pre-ordered it. It sounds just so beautiful. So E lives underwater and upon discovering something outside her home, she begins a correspondence with the renowned scholar Henry Clell. 
Their letters document their passion for their shared interests and then, of course, each other. They unravel a mystery from the deep together through these letters, but then they vanish. The story picks up a year later with the pair's siblings trying to figure out where the pair went to and also what secret the pair discovered. This sounds just very romantic, lyrical. It's underwater, so I'm kind of hoping there's an octopus involved because I love octopus. You know, all those good things. The Dead Cat Tail Assassins by P. Jelly Clark, coming April 23rd. And I have talked about this one before, and I am so excited about it because of the tagline. Ready? The Dead Cat Tail Assassins are not cats, nor do they have tails, but they are most assuredly dead. What a banger! I was drawn in. Before I even knew the blurb, even knew the premise, I was like, gotta have this. And I'm very grateful to have received an arc of this book, so I hopefully will be able to get a review to you soon about it. I have been kind of mid on Clark's first novel, A Master of Gin, but no previous experience can keep me away from a book with that kind of a tagline. So, the book, what is it about? Avine the Eviscerator, amazing name, who is an assassin, as promised, available for all of your killing needs. She is sworn to the matron of assassins and has been resurrected, trained to be a deadly killer and wiped of her memories, along with all the others in her order. Of course, Avine gets a job that brings her into conflict with her past that she's not supposed to remember, of course, and brings up all sorts of trouble for her. The vows that the dead cat tail assassins swear come with very high costs of breaking those vows. I'm so stoked about this. I mean, I'm not expecting anything amazingly revolutionary, but I am expecting a fantastic, gruesome time. The Brides of High Hill by Ni Vo, May 7th. This is the fifth entry into the Singing Hills cycle, which I have all previously talked about how much I love that cycle, so very excited. If I recall correctly, this is the final one that Tor.com, rebranded Reactor, has contract with Vo. So I'm not sure if we're going to be getting more after this entry. Much like TV series, book series can go on for too long if the author isn't careful, so we will see at the end of this one if I feel like there is space for more or if we've kind of wrapped everything up. This one is about Chi accompanying a young bride to her wedding to an aging ruler of a crumbling estate, estate at the crossroads of an empire. Vibes are very much off when they arrive because they realize something is haunting the manor. The bride and Chi are drawn to solving the mystery of what happened to the man's previous wives ensure, and ensuring the safety of our current bride. This is giving blue beard and paired with Vo's fantastic storytelling abilities and her careful contemplation of character and story itself. I'm assuming this will be a great blend of creepy and insightful. I'm also enjoying the sort of gothic haunted house energy that this is giving off as well. That's been a little bit of a trend lately, and so I'm curious to see what Vo is going to do with that because I think she'll take it in a very different direction than we have been seeing a lot of lately. A Spin of Fate by A. A. Vora, uh, coming on May 7th. I was inspired to read this after Reads with Rachel's review video of it. She spoke so effusively about the book, I was completely sold. I don't normally read or like YA, particularly when there's more of the books to come out. I often abandon YA series after reading the first one if the rest aren't available, because I just usually don't get invested enough. But Rachel convinced me, so here we are. Um, I generally trust Rachel's opinions on books, so I'm willing to give it a go. She has already read the book. She was lucky enough to receive an arc of it. So if you're interested to hear even more, I would go check out her video. Um, I'll link it below. But if you're interested in just getting a brief synopsis rather than review, continue on with me. So there are four layers to this city, and depending on how good you are, which is publicly broadcast via your soul spinning on your forehead, which I will admit sounds kind of like gimmicky and weird, but the way Rachel described it made it sound not. So I'm just really curious about how uh, Vora is going to kind of convey that without making it sound trite. So this soul spinning thing determines what level of the city you live on. So the people on the lowest level have like, quote unquote, the worst souls and the people at the top are essentially like living in heaven, right? In theory, you can move up or down, but this happens extremely infrequently, as you might assume. So our main girl, Aina, gets m to move up a level, but she is not happy about this because it takes her away from her family. So she tries to commit 
petty crimes and cause other havoc that would get her sent back down, but it doesn't work. So she unites with Mazin, who is living somewhat outside this whole system, because he's just trying to keep his clan from extinction. He doesn't have a lot of investment in this level's soul system. And she also teams up with Aranel, who is a spoiled noble from the higher levels, who's learning about how the system isn't as just as he believes. He's benefited from the system his whole life, um, but he's kind of realizing things don't work the way that he thought they did, and also coming to terms with some of his own anxieties about his place in this world. So, like I said, I don't normally read YA, but Rachel convinced me that this would be a good read. Themes that she was talking about and it just sounded really compelling. So I'm um, give it a go. <sighs> 21st, we have The Last Murder at the End of the World by Stuart Turton. Like I mentioned a couple of times, I am kind of randomly entering my mystery era, and Stuart Turton is a decently popular name in the genre, particularly mysteries that have some sort of science fiction element, from what I can gather. His most famous book is The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle, which I actually just got out from my library. We'll see if I like that, and if I don't, this book might just disappear off of my list. But assuming that I do, here's what this book is about. Our heroes need to solve a murder to save what is left of the world. There is just this one island left on the world because everyone and everywhere else has been destroyed by this like poison fog of some kind. So on the island there are 122 villagers and three scientists and they all kind of vibe together but the scientists are the ones who control everything and they tell all the villagers what to do and the villagers go about doing you know farming and hunting and building and like all of these tasks and the scientists they have I guess some sort of like facility that they live in where they do d d science I suppose so but everything then changes when one of the scientists turns up dead He's been brutally stabbed to death, and his death triggered a lowering of the security system around the island, which has been the only thing that has kept the fog at bay. I have some questions regarding if the scientist died of natural causes, would that also have triggered the system? I'm assuming that there is a lot more to this whole, like, killer fog situation than we're being told. It's kind of giving wool by Hugh Howey energy in that regard. So they are now on a tight deadline to solve the murder or everyone is going to be killed by the fog. If they can solve the murder, the security system apparently gets like reactivated and then they'll all be safe. As an added complication, the security system has wiped everyone's memories of what happened the night before. So whoever the murderer is probably doesn't even know it. So this is an absolutely wild premise with so many different elements <laughs> that this could be absolutely terrible. I could see this being very bad because there's just so much going on. I don't know Turton as a writer to be able to tell you at all if I think he'll be able to pull it off, but I'm hoping this will be like a silly goofy little time with lots of like hijinks and a little murder and some interesting twists, you know? Lost Ark Dreaming by Sui Davies Okungboa coming on May 21st. So this is a climate fiction novel, one of my favorite sub-genres, so I jumped all over with this one. I requested an e-arc of it, and I'm very grateful to have received one, so expect a more in-depth review of that coming soon. But... This is set off the coast of West Africa, which used to be part of the land of West Africa. The rise of the Atlantic Ocean has partially submerged these like kilometers tall um, so skyscrapers that are now called the Fingers, because there's, there's five of them, so it's like sticking up out of the water. You get what I'm saying. They're originally designed as a playground for the wealthy, but now they house everyone who was like in this land while the, the waters were rising. The wealthy still live there on the top floors, but everyone else now lives below the new sea level. And these submerged levels are, as you might expect, full of disease, crowded, smelly, dangerous, etc. As an added bonus to this whole situation, the dead are rising, <laughs> just casually, and they want 
revenge because so many of them were killed due to the environmental disasters and many of these deaths obviously could have been prevented. Our three main characters are Yakene, who is a mid-level analyst. And I'm wondering if mid-level refers both to where in the tower you live, but and also his um like rank. Toyo, uh, who is an undersea mechanic, and Ngozi, a narcissistic bureaucrat. So I'm, ima- I'm assuming, what I'm imagining is that we have like someone from the very top, someone from the middle of the tower, and someone from the bottom. So again, this is kind of giving wool by hue. Um, then these three disparate individuals will need to work together to build any sort of future worth living. So in addition to wool by Hugh Howie, this is also kind of giving me 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. But kind of what I wanted that book to be. I'm assuming, based on the premise, there's not going to be the kind of techno fix and sort of just like magical, like, oh, we solved all the problems um, at the end of this one, like there was in 2140. It's also significantly shorter. <laughs> and as I have mentioned previously, I'm very interested in contemporary African science fiction and fantasy. So I'm really excited to see more of it be available in the United States. Rounding out May, we have Nine Tales. Nine Tales by Sally Wen Mao. For any who don't know, the Ninetale Fox is a common trickster figure in a number of different Asian mythologies and folklores. According to the blurb, Mao's imagining of the fox in this collection of stories is as someone fiercely feminist in their actions, carving out a place for themselves in a world that refuses to accept them. She presents the fox as, quote, an icon of vengeance, solidarity, and solidarity and liberation. So this sounds fierce, fun, brutal, uh, cutting, insightful. I'm really excited about it. You might have picked up that I like things that kind of punch you with intensity in terms of theming and plot. Moving on to June, we are almost to summer. Uh, We have Mirrored Heavens by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is the third book in the Between Earth and Sky trilogy, a series I very much enjoy. Obviously, I'm not about to tell you anything that happens in this book in case you haven't read the rest of them, but let me tell you that the first one, Black Sun, excellent. So check it out. Uh, We have a new book from Adrian Tchaikovsky also coming on June 4th, Service Model. The comps for this title are Red Shirts by John Scalzi and Murderbot by Martha Wells. So I'm expecting a ridiculous science fiction romp from one of its most acclaimed writers, which is just truly a thrilling uh, gift that the universe is offering me Hopefully. The, the premise, though, if you didn't know those were the comp titles, you would not think was going to be a fun little romp because in this world, humanity is dying out and is entirely relying on artificial labors. But then one robot breaks free of its programming and dives into a world where humanity is no longer the planet's ruler. And how does the robot bike free? By murdering its human. It's kind of giving 2001 Space Odyssey, but again, the comp titles are not giving dark. (laughs) So I'm thinking this is less about robots destroying humanity and more about robots having to figure out what to do when humanity destroys itself with a healthy sprinkling of ridiculousness and like meta self-awareness. We'll see. Mouth by Paloma Ghosh coming on June 11th. So this is another short story collection. And you might have predicted by the title, this is a collection about desire and the body. Ghosh uses speculative and fantastical tropes to explore grief, intimacy, sexuality, and bodily autonomy, giving these things sharp edges and cutting surrealism, at least according to the blurb. I love a good absurdist philosophical romp, and I also really like body horror. I think I've mentioned that before. Specifically when the body horror is used to explore the gruesomeness of our lived experiences and the way that the emotional, the psychological, and the physical are all so closely woven together. And I'm getting some of that energy here. June 18th, we have Rakesfall by Vandra Chandraschiera coming on June 18th. This is the same author that wrote The Saint of Bright Doors, which is embarrassing because this was on my TBR for last year and I never read it. And now the author has a second book coming out. So I'm committing to read both of these books this year, especially because, spoiler, The Saint of Bright Doors just won the Crawford Award. We'll be seeing that crop up in our second season of the award series. This book is about Annalise and Leverett, or Leveret, throughout all of their lifetimes, 
fighting against all the forces arrayed against them, always trying to find each other again and again in every reincarnation. It's interesting that this is the second book on this list that is kind of dealing with these themes of love across time and space and even like, and even perhaps across bodies. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that means, what that says, where that's going, but it's an observation that I'm having. All right, our last one is technically coming out in the summer, but it's coming out on June 25th. So I'm considering this the last hurrah of spring before summer is here in full force. And also, I just wanted to tell you all about this book because it is We Shall Be Monsters by Tara Sim. This book is billed as Frankenstein meets Indian mythology. And I love Frankenstein. And the one and only book I've read based on Indian mythology, Kakye, I also very much enjoyed. So I have high hopes here, especially based on the premise. When Kajal's sister, Lazia, dies, Kajal swears to bring her back to life. But unfortunately, this process corrupts her sister's soul and turns her into a violent spirit bent on homicide and revenge. As you do, everyone makes mistakes. Everyone has bad days. Since Lacia is, by all accounts, dead, Kajal is blamed for all of the murders that the violent ghost sister has committed, and she is thrown into prison. All is not lost, though, because some rebels find out what she has done, break her out of prison on the condition that she brings back this prince um, so that they can, you know, do a revolution or whatever. She doesn't mention necessarily how badly the first go-round went, and kind of surprising no one, the second go-round does not go much better. So Kajal now having to balance her murderous sister, the rebels who want to have a revolution, the fact that her resurrection went badly yet again, maybe our girl needs to stop trying to bring people back from the dead, and also her own past coming back to haunt her, uh, literally, in the form of her evil ghost sister. The takeaway that I have from the spring books that I put on this list, and it will be in the description below, if you haven't noticed, every book I talk about in my videos is always listed. One of the things though about this list, I'm seeing a lot of ridiculousness paired with kind of gruesomeness. A lot going on here about love, relationships, and also we got some creepy coming out through here. Um, it's going to be an exciting spring, I think. There's a lot of good stuff coming out. I didn't even include everything, honestly, that I saw, and I've watched other people's upcoming releases, and there's just so much good stuff coming out. So leave me a comment below about what books you are interested in coming out, what books you think I should add to my spring TBR, what is going to be, what is going to be the hot book of the spring. I want to know. One of my goals in life is to be just like all the other girls. So what are the girlies going to be reading to prepare us for summer? What is the spring energy? I will see you all in the next one and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye!